12, beginning on verse, at verse 9, which is page 126, oh, I think it is. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honourable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The second reading is from Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28, and it's on page uh, 745, if you're following it in the Bible. Jesus predicts his own death. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of Christ. the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. <clears throat> Amen. So last Sunday, we heard Jesus question, who do you think I am? And in response, we also heard Peter's great confession, you are the Christ the son of the living God. This morning we'll focus on the scene that follows 
right from that. After Jesus made his confession, Je- um, sorry, after Peter made his confession, Jesus commended him, went on to tell the disciples what was to come. Just as we heard, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed. And the third day, be raised up. Peter still holds the world record for the fastest change in spiritual status. Within the span of only a few minutes, Peter went from Rocky the Blessed, upon whom the church would be built, to Satan the Scandal. This change of status happens when Peter, or Rocky, takes it on himself to give Jesus a little bit of a lesson in theology. So he pulls Jesus aside, away from the other disciples, the way we might see our prime minister consult with his or her chief of staff on matters that don't, consider, uh, don't concern us little people. And Peter assumes the posture of a superior educating an inferior. Imagine it. With his arm around Jesus, Peter quietly but sternly tells him off. God forbid this should ever happen to you, Lord. And that's when Jesus calls Peter a Satan. But not just that. He calls Peter a scandalon, a scandal, which in Greek refers to a rock over which a person stumbles. Simon Peter is still getting depicted in in rock-like terms, but this time he's not a foundation stone, but a trip hazard. Then just to be sure, Peter and all of us get the point as to what makes the difference between being a building block or a dangerous stumbling block, Jesus launches into his famous words about bearing the cross. What I'd like us to think about this morning is this. The very same people who stand for Jesus often stand against him. As Christians, we need to be asking ourselves constantly, Am I a solid rock of faith? Am I just a stumbling block to the faith journeys of those near me? My hope is that by asking ourselves this question, we can be more intentional about our Christian journey and witness. If any want to come after me, Jesus says, they must deny themselves, take up their crosses, and follow me. But what kind of crosses did Jesus have in mind? For many years, people have misunderstood what it is to take up their cross. It doesn't mean pinning one to the lapel of your shirt or coat, or hanging one on your necklace, or pinning one into your ears. Our cross is not the boss out there who gives us a hard time. Our cross is not a child of ours that's involved in drugs. Our cross is not the prison sentence someone we love has to endure or an incurable disease we must live with or a problem in our lives that we would like to get rid of. Many times, People say, oh, just another cross to bear. Think on it. Why would anyone want to be a Christian when we're told to take up the cross and follow Jesus? We're told that to save our lives, we lose it. Look back in history, and we find that those who took Jesus seriously found life tough. It 
wasn't popular to protest the war in Vietnam back in the day. But history has proved that the protesters were actually right. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany was executed for protesting against Hitler. And the Lutheran church of his day abandoned him. Chances are, to take up your cross and to follow Jesus will cause pain and death. So to take up your cross and follow? Currently, in, in various parts of the world, to be, to be identified as Christian is to court persecution and death. Only recently, the heads of a number of Christian preachers in the Philippines were found along the side of the road as warnings to others. Yet others continued to preach. Today, to be identified with the church in China is to bring wrath, the wrath of the government, down on you and all those who attend. Yet, pastors from Hong Kong continue to travel into China to worship in house churches. Take up your cross and follow. To take up your cross is to choose Jesus' way of life over the way of society, often positioning ourselves against really powerful and respectable forces. It may involve much more risk. To take up the cross set before us may result in consequences that we here in Aotearoa only read about. Martin Luther King Jr. said from prison, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. Bonhoeffer roast, wrote of costly grace from his prison cell where his opposition to the policies of Hitler landed, um, landed on him and finally cost him his life. If we could ask any martyrs of the faith, in the past or today, they would all speak of the terror of inviting the wrath of earthly rulers to execute us as we stand our faith in our heavenly ruler. Yet we come each week and we listen to the words of Jesus. Words that we need to give us back the power to pick up the crosses that are set before us daily. They might not be the crosses of Bonhoeffer or a Martin Luther King Jr. But they are our crosses. And they might, they very well might insight in us the same fear. We gather as a community of faith. We teach our children and seek to nurture and be nurtured so that we can be faithful disciples. We gather for worship and are fed so that we can live the coming six days as disciples of Jesus, open to the needs of others. disciples, ready to speak out against injustice and prejudice when we need to. Jesus doesn't want us to cocoon in the safety of our homes or our churches. He wants us to be disciples, picking up those crosses that often require us to run into the wall of society. He doesn't want us to do good works in an effort to secure God's favor. Because you see, we already have that. We know some of the things, some of what this means when we give our time and energy for getting ourselves in the service of others. 
we carry our cross when we comfort someone who's just lost a loved one. We carry our cross when we wipe the food off the chin of someone living alone in a rest home. Or when we coach the, a team of kids to be rewarded with a smile, simple. We carry our cross when we invite others to join us for worship or speak of our faith. Those are our crosses. When we hold a child tightly and know that comfort is received. Peter looks a lot like us. Peter the rock who thought he could walk on water. Peter the rock who sank, just like any other rock would do. Peter the rock on which Jesus would build his church. Peter the stumbling block. This was Peter, whom Jesus loved enough to shake up and push beyond his comfort zone as his disciple, knowing that he would indeed pick up his cross and follow Jesus. The story for us, 11 Sharp, is not over yet. Because Jesus calls us every moment to take up our cross, follow him. There's a story once about a pig and a chicken walking past a church, outside of which was a sign, come in, help us feed the hungry. And the chicken says to the piggy, let's go. This be our cross. Let's go and help them. And the piggy said, Hey, Chook, it's all easy for you to say because all you do is contribute and walk away. For me, it's a matter of life and death. Let's not go in. We don't know what our crosses might look like, but we are assured by our living Christ that it is the cross that lead to eternal life. The life of which Jesus speaks when he said, I have come to you so that you can have life in abundance. Not abundance in stuff or worries or cares, but abundance in fulfillment. Life which is eternal Life, which is a joy. Amen.